Welcome to Ali Fitness Podcast, a weekly production all about bringing health into fitness. Kale Brock is an award-nominated writer, producer, and speaker. With a special interest in health and well-being, Kale has just released The Gut Movie, in which he travels to Nambia to live with a sand tribe. So today we're going to find out a little bit more about the gut and its important role in our bodies. So firstly, Kale, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ali. Now, I appreciate you like vegetables, but I've never, <laughs> I've never even contemplated changing my name to uh, <laughs> kale or broccoli, but I'm just assuming that you changed your name or? Well, I actually didn't. So this is the question that I get asked probably most frequently on <laughs> little media appearances. Is that your real name? And it is, in fact, almost to the point where I'm starting to include my birth certificate in my presentations now. So <laughs> it was the name I was given with no middle name, just Kale Brock. And then I um, decided to roll with it. And now my Instagram and Facebook is at Kale's Broccoli. So <laughs> it's a very cruciferous name. That's really interesting. So, Cal, I know that you've had health issues in the past, and I sort of wanted to start there. Can you just let us know about your health issues as a teenager and and how that potentially shaped your career? Sure. I mean, a lot of people who have heard me speak before will know this. I actually was diagnosed with a heart condition when I was 16 years old. The condition was called supraventricular tachycardia, SVT for short, which is a long, scary-sounding name, but essentially I would experience heart arrhythmias, irregularities in my heartbeat to the point where I would almost faint. So I would become very lightheaded and go quite gray. Yeah, I would almost faint. And as an avid surfer, this would often happen out in the ocean. And, you know, almost fainting out in the ocean is not the best situation to be in, you know, for safety reasons. So understandably so, we went to the cardiologist and they hooked me up to all these different batteries, sent me home with a little portable ECG monitor And we came back and did some tests and they found that I had this condition. They said, okay, yeah, we know what that is. I remember seeing on the heart rate monitor my heart jumping up well into the 250s beats per minute. It was very, very high. And, you know, it was basically wasn't working properly. So the only option I was given from the medical establishment at that point was to undergo an ablation. And an ablation is where they wanted to enter my heart and actually burn away a piece of the heart. They wanted to burn the sinoatrial node because it wasn't working properly. And I sort of said, that's a little bit illogical. Can't we actually look at, you know, fixing the thing that's not working? Why do we have to destroy it? And that sort of stumped the cardiologist. He said, well, this is the only option we've got. I said, what about nutrition? And he said, well, it's got nothing to do with it. And at that point, I decided to do some more investigation. You know, mum sort of said she was sitting with me. She said, look, you've got to be comfortable with this. And I agree, you probably shouldn't be having heart surgery at the age of 16. So I went down a different path. And long story short, I actually got to work with a naturopath, pretty much doing clinical work experience with her for about nine years. And she was able to teach me in a very short amount of time some very basic health principles, which completely turned my life around. You know, long story short, I was able to actually reverse that condition naturally within about six months. So a massive, massive difference is going from a diagnosis of, you know, there's nothing you can do, you're going to have it for the rest of your life, to reversing it in about six months and now managing it successfully for 10 years. That's where my interest in health and well-being started. And as a curious person with journalistic tendencies, I had a lot of research and questions to ask, and that's now become my vocation is to sort of tell stories surrounding health and at the moment in particular gut health and provide a medium on which various experts can share what they're doing, their incredible work that they're doing. So I've, got, I've pretty much got the easy job now, which is pretty nice. All the experts do the hard work and the research and the clinical hours, and I just swoop in and, and steal the glory by making a film about it all. <laughs> Excellent. So, Cal, what were those few things that you changed that made you so healthy and get over this issue with the heart? I don't know exactly what it was which really had an impact on my heart. I did write a blog about exactly what I did because I got so many questions and I actually, when I was health coaching, was lucky enough to work with a couple of people with the same condition who also achieved the same result. So I still don't know exactly what we did, but I believe it was just, you know, getting on a whole foods diet, focusing on, you know, a lot of plant foods, with a little bit of animal protein, really balancing my blood sugar, fixing up 
my gut health, fixing up any malnutrient or gaps in my nutrition with some basic supplementation like minerals and trace elements and some probiotics. And yeah, just over time, that started to dissipate that condition. And now, you know, going from experiencing arrhythmias once every week or a couple of times a week to now, you know, I can't even remember the last time it happened. So it's a pretty stark thing. And I think, you know, we all have the capacity to heal when we give the body the right raw materials. And I suppose if you look at what I did, it would be giving the body the right raw material so that it can heal. Because as you know, chiropractors will say, the body is a self-regulating and self-healing mechanism. It can do that. We just need to give it, yeah, the right stuff. Mm, and it's interesting that you had a heart issue, but it was actually the gut that you attacked or, or addressed. Mm. Yeah, and that's sort of what science is confirming is that the gut and the microbiome is sort of this foundational health principle that we need to have in balance if we are expecting optimal health and wellness because without it, we're you know using crutches really. It's quite a big bang for your buck part of your health. When you get it right, it makes everything else or at least treating everything else much easier. It's not to say that you don't need to use targeted methods such as, you know, emotional therapy or something with the mental illness, for instance, it just makes it a lot easier or it makes those methods more effective when you have good gut health on your side. And to put it into perspective, do you know the stats on gut issues? I guess it's probably hard to say, but do you have any information on that? One of the biggest questions is what is a gut health issue? Because a lot of it's not recognized as being a gut health issue in the conventional medicine space, at least. You know, we have millions of people with autoimmune disorders, for instance, but they're not recognized as being a gut microbiome issue. You know, we have people with mental illness or mental challenges or emotional challenges who are also, you know, diagnosed in the brain only with no recognition of a potential connection with the gut microbiome. So it's very hard to say. I mean, officially, the statistics would be the well bandy term is, you know, at least half of us have some sort of digestive issue. But I would sort of say that at least 90 to 95 percent of us really have a digestive issue. And, you know, of course, we've got rates on bowel cancer and stuff, which are sadly increasing when it's, you know, a very, very preventable illness. So there's a lot of stuff going on. It's there for a variety of reasons. It's not just the fact that we're diagnosing more illness now, it's also because we're using antibiotics frivolously. We're misusing antibiotics, I should say, which you know, even the World Health Organization is it saying. And unfortunately, Australian GPs are some of the, the worst, unfortunately, in terms of statistics on over-prescribing antibiotics for things like acute respiratory infections. And we're also eating a lot of processed sugar and things like that. And also, I will say that we're walking into the GP's office expecting antibiotics, so we quite often get them. I think we're very misinformed as a general population in terms of how the things we take, what we eat, how we live impacts our gut microbiome. And I'm interested to talk to you a bit more about your movie. I understand that it's a bit of a quirky take and it's not too serious, but it does address some serious issues. Can you give us a bit of an insight as to who you interview and what their sort of overall maybe take on the gut is from these professionals? Yeah, I mean, one of the goals with the film was to try and make it approachable for everyone. It's not a movie just for gut health enthusiasts because I think when you do that, you further isolate everybody else, quote unquote, who's not interested in the gut or finds it boring or is just, you know, in a different space. So my goal throughout all my work is to make the message of health and wellness, the various aspects of it, entertaining and interesting enough so that anybody will actually engage with it. From the feedback we've been getting, that's been a success with the film. The whole sort of origins of the film started when I did my Gut Healing Summit, which was an online event where I interviewed about 16 different experts from around the world on the gut and the microbiome, looking largely at does the optimal microbiome exist? After that summit, I had a lot of questions. I had a lot more questions. I thought, there's a good story in this. We can make a story out of this. So I called a friend and you know, gave him my idea, which was essentially to go and live with a tribe who had not been exposed to antibiotics, who were still living traditionally from the land, and to test their microbiome and to test my microbiome to see how it changed whilst I lived with them. 
I called him and said, look, is there anyone around who actually fits this sort of profile, checks all the boxes? He said, well, yeah, there is actually. So long story short, very long story short, we went to Namibia. I was able to live with this tribe who were living traditionally from the land and test their microbiome to see how it changed. And during the story of that, we actually bounce back to various experts who share their incredible knowledge on the gut microbiome. We had Dr. Damien Christoph. We had Dr. Margie Smith, who's a molecular geneticist. She ran all our microbiome testing analysis parts of the story. So that was really cool to see. We had John Elliman, a microbiologist. We had Professor Thomas Barodi, who pioneered essentially fecal microbiota transplants here in Australia and largely around the world. He's had some incredible results using FMT and has done about 13,500 of them. And yet it's still a largely uncovered topic of gut health, which is completely insane. And we also had Professor Mimi Tang from the Murdoch Children's Research Institute down in Melbourne, and she was able to share with us her research on allergies and reversing peanut allergies in children using probiotic oral immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. So we had some pretty cool stuff come through. The experts were very, very helpful. We had Sindo Mira as well sharing some stuff. And yeah, I think that's really what I wanted to achieve was to let those guys do all the all the talking and try and distill it into a simple, comprehensive and entertaining message. And of course, when you start talking about poo a lot, things can get entertaining. So <laughs> I think that's sort of how it all ended up rolling out in the film is it's quite a cinematic. Obviously, when you go to Africa, there's so many beautiful vistas that we were able to capture on film with the drone and stuff. So it's a really cinematic health film. You know, we've only got two clips from stock footage, whereas most health films are 80 to 90% stock footage. So it's a very much a story-based film. And I think that's why people are connecting with it a lot more than your traditional health film, because there is a story. People are engaged. They're vested in the outcome. And the outcome in this situation was quite stark and astonishing. So it was a massive project. A lot of work went into it and a, you know, a lot of stress as well. <laughs> and um, I'm really, really right now just starting to process what's been happening over the past few weeks because I've been traveling around Australia screening it. So it's it's crazy and the, the opportunities coming at me, I'm still sort of, I just don't know what to do with them. So it's really, I'm still pretty hectic at the moment, but it's, no, it's it's been really cool. Yeah, it sounds very overwhelming, and and I get to Australia the day after it finishes debuting, so I can't <laughs> I can't wait to watch it in another form when it comes out, and mm. I can't wait to see how you interact with the Sand Tribe. Can you give us a bit of a rundown about how they experienced you joining them, and and how you lived your life with them, and and how your diet changed while you were with them? They were super open. They were some of the friendliest, most beautiful people. I'd ever traveled to meet and they, they welcomed us with open arms. That little village that we worked with is essentially a conservancy, which means it's a sort of living museum, if you will, where the Bushmen can actually maintain their traditional ways of living. And we were able to sort of sort out a filming permit to go and, and live with them. So they knew we were coming, but they didn't really know what for. <laughs> That sort of led to interesting situations when we began requesting some of their poo samples, which makes for pretty funny viewing in the film. It was weird because it was so far removed from Western society. I mean, the closest town, and you wouldn't even call it a town really, is 25 kilometers away. And then from there, you've got the next, I suppose, big town, which is really like a country town here, which is probably another four hours drive away. So they're very, very remote. And so we took about three days to actually get out to them. So we're very tired. We got there and we set up our tents because, you know, there are scorpions and death adders and lions literally not too far away that we, we heard the day before we were there. There was a lion that had killed a kudu only one kilometer away and was feasting on the carcass. So it was quite... <laughs> Very wild Africa. You know, this isn't a fenced in game park or fenced in animal free zone. This is truly wild Africa. So we were out walking with the Bushmen every day, foraging for food. And we did find things like bush onions, bush potatoes, just various versions of foods we have over here, but truly wild versions of them. So heirloom varieties and, you know, big tubers that we found underground, some berries. 
and you know we went hunting as well and that was a pretty incredible experience too quite surprising for me how impactful that experience was and you know they were also able to share with us some of their dancing and celebratory acts and yeah they were just overall a very relaxed stress free beautiful community minded culture and you know i think with all the talk on the food side of it and the biology side of it and the microbiology side of it, I still think one of the biggest things that I've brought back is the emotional and societal parts of the experience. You know, how can I start to reapproximate that in my own life here by being connected with my food supply and de-stressing and developing a really strong sense of community? All those sorts of things that have really yeah, had a big impact on me and have become significant areas of my life that I'm now working on. Interesting. So it sounds like it's a bit more about how you eat and who you eat with and the whole culture around it as opposed to what you are actually eating? I think so. And I think that's really where a lot of the science will go. It won't be so obsessed with what you're eating because, like you said, how we eat and who we eat with is going to have a massive impact on not only our digestion, also the state of our gut microbiome and our gut lining. We know that stress seems to stimulate the gut lining to become leaky, less integrity in the gut lining. So I think that's an area of the gut story that is still in its infant stages and we can expect more on that. But it was really cool to observe and at least comment on for now without looking at all the science because it's not there on that sort of thing. So I think when it comes to the gut, food is going to be always very, 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 very important. But I don't want to dismiss these other factors just yet. Mm. And can you share with us a few test results? From the, the film? Mm. Yeah, so without spoiling it, we focus largely on microbial diversity as one of the main indicators of microbiome health because that's being used quite commonly across the board as an indicator of microbiome health. We focused largely on that, particularly with me. We did go into some specifics, like for instance, I had a lot of Fecali bacterium prasnutsi, which is almost like a, another language, but it's actually considered one of the probiotics of the future. And that particular probiotic is very, very anti inflammatory. So we did chat about that. And I had a lot of oxycobacter, which help you digest those oxalates found in green leafy vegetables like kale and spinach and stuff. You know, it's interesting to observe that, but we did focus largely on microbial diversity as that measurement to see how my microbiome was impacted whilst I was there. And so we took the test beforehand back in Australia and then took the test on the last day with the Bushman. And there were some pretty astonishing results without giving the exact details. The change in my microbial diversity was very significant after only a week. So that was really cool to see. And we found that the sun had very diverse microbiomes and had a lot of bacteroidetes in there, which is indicative of very good gut pH and a lot of plant food, a lot of fiber, which seemed to be working very, very well for them. And they were all very, very lean individuals for the most part. And they seemed to exude a very high degree of vibrance and vitality, which you don't see that often here. I think. And it was a very, very stark difference, especially the amount of people who are overweight and unhealthy visibly. So, you know, obviously we can't measure everything, but visibly was very low compared to here in the West. So even just those sorts of things were things we noticed straight away and commented on in the film. Mm, interesting. So presumably a lot of people who are going to watch this movie are going to be inspired. What's your hope, I guess, with the general public in relation to actions that they might take after watching the movie. Yeah, and it's funny because I think when you talk about the gut microbiome, it's an area where it's very difficult to make blanket statements because there exists a very large gray area because all of us are unique and we all require different foods and different diets and different approaches to thrive. And the intention with the film was to generate discussion which starts with questions normally about the gut and the microbiome because I found over my time in this space that a lot of people are not making informed decisions 
about their health, about what they accept as advice from various practitioners, not just the conventional space, but also the alternative space. And we seem to try to be attacking the gut back to wellness when I think that we really need to be nourishing the gut back to wellness. There's a very, very big difference. And a lot of people are obsessed with antifungal, antimicrobial, anti this, anti that. And I don't necessarily think that that's a smart move because we know so little about the gut microbiome. You may have an infection, but that infection may be serving you in some way because your microbiome is always adapting to what you're doing to it, what you're eating, how you're living, how you're moving, how you're interacting with the environment. And that's another thing is the importance of environmental interaction in establishing a diverse microbiome, which helps you thrive in that particular ecology. You know, a lot of us are spending all our time indoors now. We're never going outside and we're expecting to, you know, have this great health when really you need to be an outdoors human. You need to live like a human being in order to attain that. So all those sorts of things I think come up in the film and a lot of people, I think, because of the way we tied together the film in that it's quite entertaining, it's quite engaging, it's quite cinematic. A lot of people are feeling uplifted instead of scared. You know, I feel like a lot of the health documentaries out there now are health scares. They're not healthcare. You know, I really wanted to shake the boat there and go in a different direction to what everyone else was doing. Yeah, it's been nice to see. This is one of the best things is when you see someone walk in and you know straight away that they're there only because they're supporting their partner and you see them walk out and they come up and go, you know, that was really cool. I'm actually really interested in this now. And those moments really are where I feel like the film's a success because to be honest, it's quite easy to turn someone who's already a fan of gut health into a fan of the movie because it's very hot topic. It's very well done. But to convince someone who's just sort of semi-interested, that's where it gets a little bit challenging. And when you succeed in doing that, I feel like we can really make a big impact with the film. And again, it is about people asking questions. It's about them saying, well, hey, what if I don't use antibiotics for this cold? You know, and obviously they do that with a good practitioner. But, you know, it's about asking those questions, generating discussion, monitoring where we're at, monitoring how our body is reacting to the foods we're having and how we're living and all those sorts of things. Yeah. And like I said, I I feel like we've achieved that, which is really, really nice and humbling. Mm, That's really good. And I think a lot of people will come away from the movie and just want to take control of their own health, won't they? Yeah, I think so. And it's funny that they do that without knowing the whole story. We're always trying to share the whole story. We need to know every little part of the puzzle when, you know, the puzzle's different for everybody. The pieces are different for everybody. So it's very important to empower people to be in control of their health and well-being, not to create a drip feed situation where they have to come to you for advice on their health and well-being. It's important to get them into a space where they can start to listen to their inner nutritionist and to make calls based upon how their body's feeling and what their activity levels are like and what their stress levels are like, what the season is, all these different things that we're glancing over because we're obsessed with the macronutrients coming in instead of you know our intuition. So yeah, I think through osmosis or through a very subtle message, we definitely encourage that sort of mindset within the gut movie. That's awesome, Kale. And presumably a lot of people that come to you with a lot of questions, and and I'm assuming one of the questions might be, who should I see? What sort Mm. of integrated health doctor or what sort of health practitioner should I see? And can you give me a name? (laughs) (laughs) What's your response to that? It's a tricky one because (laughs) I just don't know everybody. And I know there are some really good practitioners out there, integrative GPs, you know, NDs, MDs. You know, they are out there. They're just quite often tricky to find. And, you know, the ACNEM website is quite good. A-C-N-E-M is quite a good website for that. I've got on my website, kalebrock.com.au forward slash recommended, where I've got some good practitioners there. I just think it's a really good place to start is to get some good coaching in and make sure that everything's working for you. And if you have to, get some testing done as well, which can be really important. 
So, yeah, and sometimes people are in a space where they can do it on their own because they don't have any serious health issues going on and they're just interested in improving performance or becoming a better dad or becoming a little bit thinner or whatever. So there's always going to be situations where people can sort of go at it on their own through a sort of self-experimentation style where it's safe to do so, which is, you know, a lot of young people are are capable of doing that because they don't have anything serious going on. But at the same time, you know, it is finding a good coach, a good mentor who's getting good results, not only with their own health, but with patients as well, to work with them and appreciate that it's a journey. It's not an overnight stop. You've really got to put in a little bit of effort to cultivate health and wellness long term. This is a long term game. There's no point in just getting healthy for six weeks. You know, I'd rather people eat 80% perfect for the rest of their life than 100% perfect for eight weeks. It's a very much a long-term game. And as Professor Mimi Tang said in the film, the long-term diet is the most critical factor in establishing a healthy microbiome long-term. You know, you can change the microbiome within 24 to 48 hours. It fluctuates very quickly and adapts to what you're doing. It's a very good idea to pace yourself. It's almost like a marathon. You know, you've got to pace yourself. It's not a sprint. So yeah, those are all things that I've sort of become passionate about. And those are the sort of things I share with people when they do ask those questions after the film. You mentioned also that you did interviews with some experts and, and one one in particular in discussion about fetal transplants. And it interests me a lot because I've heard of great success stories with it, but it does seem to be still very controversial and or, or at least not easily approachable. I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts were around it or your experience. So FMT, fecal microbiota transplantation, is essentially the long technical words for a poo transplant. So this is taking poo from a healthy individual who's been tested for infections and tested to have a a clean, healthy microbiome, implanting that poo into another human being who is experiencing health challenges like, for instance, IBD, Crohn's, IBS, or C. difficile infection, which is you know a form of diarrhea. Those are the main things that it's being used for. Now, What's interesting is that a lot of those digestive conditions are getting some really positive turnarounds after FMT. However, there seems to be a side effect from FMT in that a lot of other conditions are also turning around. So, for instance, Parkinson's, MS, asthma, diabetes, obesity, the list goes on. It's pretty astonishing the sort of health outcomes that people are experiencing with FMT. You know, I was speaking with Helen Patteron last night, who's a nutritionist and naturopath here in Sydney, and she was saying that a friend of hers had an FMT and the son got the FMT too. The whole family did it together in Canada. Up until the day before, her son was on the spectrum and had not spoken a word. He was five years old. And the day after the FMT, he spoke his first word. Like it's just those little things and there are so many anecdotes out there now from people who have had FMT done that it should be receiving a lot of attention. I think the reason it's not is because, and it's not so approachable, like you said, or not so much approachable, but what's accessible, I think is a better word, is because it's poo, you know, and we still have a stigma associated with something so rudimentary or seemingly rudimentary as poo, fecal matter. But really everybody poos. And the thing is, poo is a reflection of the gut microbiome. It's just a normal process. And, you know, when we're getting results like that, it should be considered quite heavily in terms of how we actually approach health and wellness. And I'd still say that from my perspective as a journalist, as a researcher on this, FMT is still a medical procedure. It's still a procedure for people who are sick. I don't think that FMT is going to be a a positive or a good way for people to attain wellness prophylactically when we should really just be looking after our diet and our lifestyle. But I certainly think that for people who have been damaged potentially irrevocably with antibiotics, that FMT could provide that missing piece of the puzzle when it comes to re-establishing a healthy gut and subsequently a healthy body as well. Because, you know, as Dr. 
Martin Blazer has been pointing out in his work, which is largely focused on missing microbes from antibiotics, basically. There are microbes we still don't know about which may be undertaking critical roles within the human body and we're wiping them out with antibiotics. The question is how do we replace them if they're not commercial probiotics? What do we do? Well, it could be that poo transplants are the go-to for this. It sounds pretty far-fetched, but in the future, it could be a situation where we are taking crapsules, you know, to replace certain bacteria that we've lost. And Dr. Barodi said this in the film, it's, you know, it's coming. It's absolutely coming and things are changing. And we may well reach a point where the prescription is 180 caps, Bushman poo, instead of 180 caps, something else. It's going to be interesting to see how it goes. And sorry about these crazy birds that are just outside my window. I do live in the northern beaches, so it's a little bit of a forest here. Yeah, um, stop bragging. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's sort of where it's going, I believe, in that we'll be very specific about restoring the gut microbiome back to its optimal state because that's sort of what we landed on is that there are optimal microbiomes we just don't know enough about them yet and we don't know how many there are or if there's just one there's probably multiple and they're going to be different for everybody and it's going to be about restoring people's gut microbiomes back to their original state that we had since birth that which is going to be native to the immune system is and is not going to cause those issues that we're all unfortunately becoming used to but clearly, in the meantime, health can be, I guess, supported by good nutrition and lifestyle. What mm. lifestyle changes do you think you're going to implement? You mentioned a few after just that one-week experience. Yeah, it's amazing how just one week with the sun would have such an impact on me. For me, it's, it's really about becoming connected to my food supply. And you know, as an Indigenous Australian, I feel like I have a a responsibility to actually learn about the local ecology and learn about local foods, which I could be foraging for and harvesting. And I started my own version of hunting, which is just fishing, and I'm not very good at it just yet, but that's okay because <laughs> I'm trying to be patient. Just those little things and really getting back to nature, yeah, I think, is a big part of what I'm doing at the moment, trying to actually take and, you know, this last month has not been a good reflection of that, but trying to take mornings off and just not work up until, you know, midday and go surfing and maybe go foraging for some seaweed or fishing, like I said, or just relaxing. You know, I don't think we relax much anymore. We're all like, go, 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 because we need purpose and all this sort of different stuff. I'm trying to get even better at relaxing and taking time off, which for a Gen Y surfer is a pretty bold statement, I think, because we're already pretty good at it. So, okay. um, yeah, I think those are the biggest things that I've sort of brought back and appreciating whole foods for what they are and not judging the food based on its macronutrient content, really, you know, trying to accept what the earth and planet is giving me at certain times a year in this local environment. So like tomorrow I'm doing a big foraging workshop where I'm going to go in depth into learning about all this sort of stuff available around my area more than what I currently know. So it's just those little things which I think really have a large impact, which we underappreciate. Imagine how many microbes that I'm picking up from the local environment when I go and harvest some seaweed and, and eat it. You know, it's all those little things that I think make up a massive part of the overall human experience but we right now we're too focused on you know being keto or being fat adapted or or all these different things which are great for the certain people but you know my sort of focus has become elsewhere because the sun they're not stressing about what they're eating they're eating to survive and they're eating natural foods yes but they're thinking about the the ongoing thriving of the community those are some of the big parts of the experience that I brought back Mm, I love it. And so your next movie, what, Relax? It's going to be cool. <laughs> I don't know. Everybody's asking me what's next, but I honestly I have no idea. I'm just interested in, in telling stories and making films. And, you know, I'm speaking with a couple of book publishers at the moment. I don't know whether I have the energy right now for another book. I am very interested in making films. So, and whether they're gut health related or even health related at all, I don't know. But I, I definitely have one in the works that I'm really interested in making, but I need a lot of money to do it. So it's about chasing funding and all this different stuff. So I don't know, but hopefully the gut movie continues to do very well. And, you know, commercially, it's been a success, which is excellent as a first film. 
because not a lot of films make money. So that's been really humbling and nice because I guess you've got to make a living as well. I think my intentions with the film first, because it's all self-funded, by the way, so I funded the whole film. Really, my goal was to just pay it off, you know, not make any money, but just to make enough to pay it all back. And, you know, that's been done. We've crossed that threshold already. So in one month of it being released. So that's pretty amazing. And I didn't expect that. Hopefully it's all sort of up from here. And over the next couple of years, I'm sure I'll shift and transition into new areas of health. And maybe it'll be flow state and neuroscience, or maybe it'll be something completely different. I don't know. But it's a really good question that you're asking me because Every time I answer it, I, I arrive at a, a new place <laughs> to, mm. to see things from. So TBA is the answer. <laughs> I, I think you should just relax for a year and uh, create a sun tribe <laughs> in uh, northern beaches of Sydney. That sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> so, Kale, before I let you go, I've just got one question for you that I ask all my guests on the show, and that is, do you have a tattoo? <laughs> No, but it's funny because I've been thinking about getting one over the past couple of weeks and I'm concerned because I've been taught and told that you can get heavy metal, not poisoning, but you know, yes, toxicity involved with tattoos. And I think what I'm going to do is settle for a new haircut instead for a while just to take the edge off. And if I'm still desperate to get a tattoo in a year, I'll get one. But the short answer is no. I don't. I'm sorry. (laughs) Okay. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that. I had one of the doctors on the show who actually sent me some articles about toxicity and tattoos after me asking him the question. Mm -hmm. What what did they, what was your summary of those? Were they like, was it toxic? I prefer not to say because a lot of my, (laughs) (laughs) a lot of my guests already have tattoos. Um, (laughs) Too late. (laughs) Sometimes it's better not to know. Mm, Yeah. Look, thanks again, Carl, for coming on the show. Well done with your movie. And can you please let us know as soon as we can see it, apart from coming to uh, Australia and watching a premiere? We'll definitely announce as soon as it's available on a wider scale. And it is coming. It's just, you know, these things do take a little bit of time. I am endeavoring to get it on wider platforms next year. We'll announce that on my socials at Carl's Broccoli or or via the website, kalebrock.com. Excellent, and we'll include that in the show notes as well. Thanks again, Kale. Thanks for having me. For all the resources and show notes from today's episode, please go to www.ally.fitness. If you like today's episode, please show your appreciation by going to iTunes, give us a five-star review, and subscribe. Subscribe.